All right. Our um, task here is um, a little different, however. Okay. We are going to go back to this form. We're on the right hand side, we have the stress power, and we have, uh, I believe we have minus Q dotted with grad theta divided by theta. Um, yes, let me just make sure that I have the sign correct on that. Yep. All right, this is the form we want to consider. Um, what we're going to do now is. Um, what we're going to do now is the following, okay? We are going to uh, rewrite the first term here as follows. We're going to write out that material time derivative of the Helmholtz potential using the chain rule, okay? And we're going to recall in doing that that chi bar is a function of the strain and the temperature. All right. Okay. So, what this lets us do is to write write out that term as follows. Okay. We have rho uh, times uh, partial of chi bar with respect to E contracted with E dot plus partial of chi bar with respect to theta times um, the time derivative of theta, but then we remember that the time derivative of theta that we are talking about is this one. Okay. All right, um, what we're going to do now is the following. It turns out that um, I think some time ago, I think yesterday or sorry, in the, in the previous segment, I mentioned that uh, chi or chi bar also contains the strain energy, okay? So we can really think of chi bar which is written as this. as consisting of um, uh, what I will just write now as a thermal term. Plus uh, strain energy. Okay, all right. When we do this, what uh, it suggests to us is that um, we can view the derivative of chi bar with respect to E, okay, as being the same as the derivative of psi bar with respect to E, where you re recall that psi bar is our free energy density. Okay? All right. Um, okay, 
let let me let me do this let me say that this that there is a relation between them okay because i need to make that relation a little more precise than that okay in order to make that relation more precise what i'm going to do is um, multiply this relation this inequality i'm going to multiply it through by the jacobian of the deformation gradient okay all right and i'm going to do that by observing that rho the, the mass density is rho not divided by j j being the determinant of f okay when i do that what i get here is the following i get rho zero partial of chi bar with respect to e contracted with e dot plus rho zero partial of chi bar with respect to theta material time derivative of theta plus rho naught um, eta bar material time derivative of theta with respect to time okay uh, this is lesser than or equal to now to get to this I've just multiplied the left hand side by j so on the right hand side I get j sigma contracted with d minus j q dotted with spatial gradient of theta divided by theta okay now remember that chi bar was defined as a um, Helmholtz potential per unit mass it follows that multiplying the it by rho naught gives us a gives us the Helmholtz potential per unit reference volume okay okay and compare this compare this quantity with derivative of psi bar with respect to e okay whenever we introduce psi bar we always said that it was a strain energy density it was a strain energy density with respect to reference volume okay so this is the strain energy density per unit reference volume okay so I, I, I ought to say here that um, chi bar is or sorry rho zero chi bar okay this quantity rho zero chi bar is now the Helmholtz potential per unit reference volume okay and compare that with the term of this kind where psi bar was the strain energy density per unit reference volume okay all right what this lets us uh, make an identification of is that if chi bar is uh, you know it's, since chi bar contains sorry no, since rho naught chi bar contains what we originally defined as psi bar okay we can now make the observation that rho zero partial of uh, chi bar with respect to e is rho zero sorry i don't need a rho zero here it's equal to derivative of psi bar with respect to e but this is our second pure lucky cough stress okay so the whole idea is that we've introduced this, this Helmholtz potential and the fact of the matter is that the Helmholtz potential which is the Helmholtz free energy actually contains the strain energy as part of it 
It is part of the, the Helmholtz free energy because the rest of it is the thermal contribution to the free energy. Okay, so what we've been so far calling as the strain energy is just one part of this Helmholtz, of this Helmholtz free energy or the Helmholtz potential. And therefore, this type of a derivative, which, gives, which, which is how we defined the second Piola Kirchhoff stress previously, Okay, is actually reproduced here. And, and I just realized this should be a row not, not just a row. Okay. Okay, so what this lets us state that is that um, the first term in this equation at the very top, that equation, okay, sorry, that inequality at the very top, that first term is just S, our second pure Kirchhoff stress contracted with E dot plus we have now rho naught. Now, uh, observe the second and third terms, okay? Now, at least two of their factors are the same, okay? So I'm going to pull those factors together. And write that as partial of chi bar with respect to theta plus eta bar. Okay, the other thing I'm going to do is to observe that, look, in that first inequality, if we look at the first term on the right-hand side, what is J sigma? It's simply tau, right? It's tau contracted with D. I'm going to pull that term also onto the left-hand side. Okay? All of this is lesser than or equal to minus j q dot grad uh, spatial gradient of theta divided by theta. Okay? All right. Let's observe yet another thing. When we wrote out all the different forms of um, the internal stress power, Right? We wrote it out, and we wrote it out by observing that each of the, our stress tensors, the various stress tensors we defined, each of them worked by contracting itself with a um, rate of deformation, right? And and all these forms were were equal. From that development, you may recall, or you can go back and check in your notes or in the slides later, that tau contracted with d, tau contracted with d is exactly equal to S contracted with E dot. Okay? So these two terms cancel out, the first and the fourth term. All right? Okay. What about this one? What about this term? Okay? Recall from, I'm, I'm, I'm having to go to the next slide. Okay, so now let's look at what we have left here. What we have left from that inequality is uh, rho zero material time derivative of theta times um, partial of chi bar with respect to theta plus eta bar uh, is lesser than or equal to minus j q dot grad theta divided by theta, okay? All right. And this, this arrived, we arrive at this result because the stress uh, power terms cancel out. Okay, but now recall one more thing. Recall the Legendre transformation. which we wrote as chi bar, function of E, the strain, and the temperature equals E bar, function of E, and eta bar, minus theta eta bar. 
If we differentiate this Legendre transformation with respect to theta, what we get is partial of chi bar with respect to theta equals minus eta bar, okay? All right, which implies that what happens with this term? Zero, okay? What we've identified here is a constitutive relation for the entropy. Okay, so our inequality finally reduces to the following form, minus j q dotted with rad theta divided by theta is uh, greater than or equal to zero. Okay, this form is what we call the Clausius Duhem form. Right, or it's sometimes called the clausius duhem inequality, or sometimes also called the clausius duhem form of the second law. Okay, what it says is that um, essentially the, the constitutive relations we have reduce to the requirement that uh, for the second law to be satisfied, this relation has to be maintained between the heat flux and the temperature gradient. Okay, so if we wish to specify a constitutive law for the heat flux, we need to make sure that this relation is obeyed, okay? To violate it would be to violate the second law and then the physics we are specifying is um, fundamentally unsound, okay? All right, so... Um, if you now want to specify a constitutive relation, for Q, it must obey the Clausius Duhem inequality. Okay, all right. So what could be specified? Consider a law of the following form. Q equals minus K, where K is a tensor, grad theta, where K is positive, semi-definite. Okay? What does this mean? If, if K is positive semi-definite, it implies that uh, if we consider U belonging to R3, any vector, it means that U dot KU is greater than or equal to zero for all u, okay? And in fact, that it is equal to zero if and only if u itself equals zero, okay? Supposing we consider this kind type of a constitutive law, okay? Um, what does it get us? What it implies then for our inequality is that minus uh, q dot rad theta divided by theta, and I think we have a j here, okay? This term becomes equal to minus j. Now, for q, we have minus k nabla theta, right? Or k grad theta. All of this dotted with grad theta divided by theta, okay? And the inequality demands that this be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, 
and you observe that what we have here is j grad theta dotted with k grad theta divided by theta is greater than or equal to 0. That is the requirement. Okay? But this form is satisfied provided this relation holds, right? If k is positive semi-definite. Okay? So we observe that the constitutive relation that we have specified here works. Okay? This, by the way, is Fourier's law of heat conduction. Okay, where K is the conductivity tensor. Typically, we take K to be symmetric. Okay? All right. So, what we've done here is a lot. We've taken the first and second laws. We've combined them. We've seen how uh, using the Legendre transformation in that form gives us the free energy inequality, right? A fundamental principle in physics, right? The fact that free energy is, 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 is non-increasing. Furthermore, we've seen how constitutive relations uh, reside inside there, right? Inside that form of the free energy inequality. We saw how our relation for the stresses shows up there, right? A constitutive relations for elasticity, for hyperelasticity. And finally, we observed that uh, we end up with the clausius duhem form, and to satisfy that, we, sp we uh, need to only consider um, constitutive relations for the heat flux that uh, satisfy the classes Duhem inequality. And finally, that the Fourier law of heat conduction, which is the standard one for heat conduction, does indeed satisfy that inequality. Okay? And we saw that we, we in the process, we come up with the conduct conductivity tensor and we observe that the we see the usual properties for the conductivity tensor as well. Okay, we will stop here for this segment.